Dr. Kramer. So just a question out of curiosity, Danielle was talking a little bit about how you kind of switched from being like biomedical engineering based to polar scientist. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering what specifically made that change for you? Like, why did you choose that? That's a great question. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so I'm, I, you know, outside of work, I'm a climber uh, and a backcountry skier. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in the last four years, last I mean, 10 years um, climbing and skiing. I climbed Mount Hood when I was in high school and, and skied down from uh, Hogsback Ridge. Uh, and kind of all through grad school, I was, I was doing this sort of thing, um, living this like alternate life. Um, and I was finding that I was taking bigger and bigger risks. Uh, and it was sort of, it was getting harder and harder for me to justify uh, the mountaineering that I was doing. Um, so I, I really wanted the skills that I had developed, um, you know, through my <laughs> through my mistakes and, and close calls, uh, to to be useful to other people somehow. Um, and I, you know, I've also always had an interest in environmental science. You know, my ISEF project was an environmental management project. I've always had an interest um, in in climate change and in the human health human health effects of climate change. Uh, so I was very fortunate to, to find the role that I'm in um, because it was, it was a sort of this unique confluence of both my like ski mountaineering skills uh, and my electrical engineering training for a, a cause and, and, and an issue that I care really, really deeply about. So in the two papers about the sterilization of respirators that Danielle shared with us, I noticed that you had multiple co-authors from mm -hmm. many different institutions and like even internationally. Um, distance. So how important was like um, the collaboration in your research and then also just your education too? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so my, my PhD program was a joint program. Um, so basically everybody that I worked with, uh, and sometimes it seems like everyone in, in the city of Boston um, has multiple affiliations. Um, and, and I, you know, one of the reasons that I was drawn to the PhD program that, I, you know, at, at the strong program between Harvard and MIT was that uh, it really fostered these connections between clinicians and engineers. Um, and I, I think that a lot of the reason that we were able to have some modicum of success uh, with the respirator sterilization was that we had both engineers um, and clinicians working together from the get-go. Um, and I think that's really, really important uh, to not be siloed um, in, in, in different corners of academia. Um, especially in healthcare, uh, it's, you know, the fact that we had, the fact that like, basically in the same building, um, even in normal times have like nuclear engineers sitting right next to clinicians, um, get, meant that we were able to, to do some things um, and, and to get things right and to have understanding of how the tools that we were being, we were developing would be used in the clinic. Um, those, that sort of understanding is hard to build without uh, a multidisciplinary team um, and multidisciplinary training as well. How, like, with everything that's going on in the world, do you stay hopeful? And how do we, like, engage yeah. people who aren't hopeful, like, in our science and in our work? Sure. So I, I should start off by saying um, that I am not, like, a seismologist. I'm, I'm not a climate scientist, uh, the work that I'm doing is uh, in support of these experiments. You know, I'm developing the tools that the, um, the professors at universities uh, are using, but I'm not like collecting the data. I'm not interpreting the data um, for these, for the, for the climate science um, itself. You know, that being said, you don't, don't need to be a uh, atmospheric or, or, or physical scientist um, to, to be depressed <laughs> uh, and, and to be concerned about uh, the way things are going. And, and um, you know, climate change aside, I think there's been no shortage of, of, of very dismal news in the last year. Um, you know, I, I distinctly remember a moment, uh, must've been in October, where there was still these incredible shortages of PPE, you know, 1200 healthcare providers in the US had died. Um, I knew people who were sick, who were been disabled, young healthy people who have been disabled for months by COVID. And you have the administration uh, at the time 
talking about, you know, retweeting these theories that physicians had um, made up COVID uh, so that they could bill extra for it. Um, and that was that was incredibly demoralizing. Um, and we'd been working so hard uh, for for months and months. And and when MIT graduate students are tell you they're working hard, like <laughs> we were really working hard. Uh, and, and you know, being undercut. Um, yeah, I, yeah, it's it's a good question, and it's it's something to think about. Um, there's a couple things that give me hope. Um, one is that there's no shortage of of smart and capable people, and and I'm sure you all fall into that category, uh, who are tackling these issues um, and who are trying really really hard. Um, and the second thing I think, you know, as a scientist, you're you're contributing to uh, this body of knowledge uh, about the way that our, our, our universe works. Um, and that doesn't go away. You know, the, the, the things that we've discovered and the things that we have published are now in public record um, and, and they're published open access. So they'll be in public record forever. Um, there's gonna be another zoonotic pandemic, um, maybe in 10 years, maybe in a century. They'll be able to look at the work that we did um, and they'll be better prepared for it. Uh, that gives me a lot of, a lot of faith as well. Um, what was the rigor like when you were studying biomedical engineering? Did you have time to climb and ski like you mentioned, or did that kind of have to take a backseat during that time? I'm oh, I, I made time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I didn't have like, I didn't have like the best grades, um, but I made it work. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I, <laughs> I don't want to be too much of a bad influence, but at some point, you have to take care of yourself. Uh, and, you know, I found that I was more productive um, if I was getting exercise every single day. I was more productive if I was, um, you know, getting out in the mountains. Um, and so I made it work. Uh, you know, was there a trade off? Maybe, you know, maybe I would have had more papers if I just stayed inside and worked all the time. But it's not who I am. <laughs> uh, a lot of us here, or all the students here, are seniors and uh, all of the fair, all of the ISEP. Uh, Participants will eventually uh, head off to college or some future career path. Uh, yeah. What is, do you have any practical advice for us students as we venture onto our next, our next place? <laughs> I don't know that you want my advice. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have advice so much as I have a, I have a request, which is uh, I, I hope that whatever you do um, in college or in your education thereafter, uh, you're looking for and finding ways to protect um, the underserved uh, and to elevate the voices of the historically marginalized um, and, and, and to protect those around you. You know, what helps me kind of meet my gaze in the mirror uh, is knowing that I, I've at least tried, you know, <laughs> at least tried my damnedest to, to protect the, or, or to make the world a healthier and safer place. That's far more important than, you know, accolades or papers or patents. Um, and I think you'll find far more satisfaction um, it, it, you know, just, just putting in the effort, uh, to, to protect those around you and, and, and those who are, uh, historically marginalized and, and underserved. Um, I think that's more important than anything else. Uh, I'd also say you should participate in the civic process. You know, when you turn 18, first of all, find out who your representatives are both in DC and in Salem and write to them. Uh, and when you turn 18, vote and don't just vote every four years, but vote in the primaries and vote in the municipal elections. Um, most of what gets done in this country happens at the state and municipal level. And just statistically as a voter, that's where you're gonna have the most impact. Um, you know, and, and you can start by writing to your reps before you turn 18. You don't need to wait for that. <laughs>